Sam's with me again because uh, I started this video and he started making this one noise that he's got that's... Uh, the closest thing to it would be a smoke alarm, but it's louder and more sharp. And it actually hurts. Uh, so I thought if I bring him over here, he's going to be just so fascinated by the sight of himself and the camera or feeling closer. I really don't know. I'm, I'm hoping he quits because I can't just ignore it. Uh, it just hurts too much. I have to put on earplugs or I have to, you know, and it, it interferes with the video. And, uh, yeah, parrots, really. Um, don't get one on the spur of the moment. Make sure you know what you're getting into because it's difficult at the best of times, I find. I've yet to have a parrot that wasn't difficult to live with. But they're, they're fun, and I'm committed to this one. He needed a home, and we wanted a parrot that talks, and we wanted an African Grey, and, you know, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> if you get it, you might regret it. Pomegranates today. I'm having pomegranate soup and tea for lunch, and I'm having it while I'm on the camera, and I probably won't eat much, because Mr. only finally just left, and in an hour I've got someone coming over to do Reiki. So my window of opportunity for doing 20 minutes of video, which in theory only takes 20 minutes, but in fact, winds up taking closer to 40 minutes because it starts and stops, restarts, um, uh, I don't know what else, editing and uploading, not much of that, I don't really don't edit, unless I take a bunch of snippets and I jam them all together as done. Um, I don't edit because the editing software I have is buggy, crashy, glitchy, and complains that it can't read the file more often than not. And I really don't have time to play IT tech. There's better and more important things to do. I mean, I'm, I'm needing leg warmers here. See, I'm, I'm making leg warmers. Um, I've got this electronics kit to put together. It, I picked up at Princess Auto, and I've got, uh, I've got a sweater underway that I started with the, the loom weaving, and then I'm adding, I'm adding yarn to knit the rest. So I, I've got a lot going on. I don't have time to play IT tech over editing software, and as far as I've been able to tell, all the editing software that I could possibly use instead of the one I'm using costs a lot of money. Now, I'm not making money off this, so I'm not going to spend money on it. Um, I haven't had to do any fancy lighting today. Somehow the camera is seeing me properly as the foreground and letting the background white out, which is... I wish we would do that every time. Um, I wanted to talk today about a couple of new tech innovations that uh, you've probably heard about. Um, Google self-driving cars that I call auto cars and 3D printing and the different technologies. Uh, self-driving cars. I wanted to talk about what it's like out there on the roads driving with people that really aren't paying attention or just plain incompetent. It's it's really frightening. Well, I don't need to tell you, do I? You've seen, you've seen videos of crash scenes. You've seen people do stupid things. I mean, I had a driver pull out from a full stop at a yield. I mean, he was at a yield sign. I was on a main, a main artery for the neighborhood. It was a slow neighborhood, and I was only doing, I think I was doing 35 because I was just started slowing down for the school zone, but I was on ice, so slowing down wasn't a matter of braking so much as a matter of gradually reducing wheel rotation. When this guy just put his foot on the gas, while staring me in the face, drove in front of me. We were on sheer ice, the city hadn't done any sand, and it was just smooth, polished white surface like, surface like marble, and slick as water on ice. I mean, it was just no traction, not, not even with the winter tires. So I, I hit the steering wheel like this, hoping to turn and go parallel to this guy as he's coming across my path and um, wound up actually in fact turning. He's, he's like, we're like this and we wound up doing this and uh, so smacked him up, cracked the, the shell on my car and got it totaled, had to buy it back, had to fix it. I do have my car back. But, so that's the kind of drivers. Why would he do that? I, I don't know. Since I repainted the car, it hasn't happened again, but it happened multiple times before. And the drivers were always staring right at me, which kind of belies the question of, oh, your car wasn't obvious, they couldn't see it. They're looking at me! What can't they see? 
didn't understand that. So self-driving cars are going to really help with that problem. I don't think they've got the technology to where the car knows how to handle itself on ice. So we're not going to see it in Canada for a while yet. Maybe when I'm getting too old to drive, I don't know. I love to drive. I drive. Well, I've got a good driving record. There's no point in saying I'm a good driver because everybody says that, whether it's true or not. Um, and if they don't, then they don't drive. Anybody who recognizes himself as a lousy driver generally finds another way to get around. Um, so I, I'd love to say I'm a good driver. I think I'm a good driver, but I think it's better to say I have a really good driving record. Um, I've had of any kind of tickets. I've only had one moving violation. No, two. I've had two radar hits for driving too fast. Um, I've had two parking tickets. And I've been ticketed twice for having lights on my car that were illegal. That's my driving record. And one accident. Uh, well, I had a, I've had a couple accidents on motorbike because I'm a nude biker and um, motorbike and bicycle aren't exactly the same and you can't do everything on a motorbike that you can do on a bicycle. Like a track stand, for instance. <laughs> that was a bad accident. Um, so, okay, enough about that. The point being, self-driving cars don't make mistakes. I mean, you're, you're scared of it. What if the computer goes glitchy? I'm sorry, but computers don't go glitchy. People glitch out. Computers just do what you tell them to, and they do it exactly the way you tell them to. So once the programmers have got that car programmed, groovy, now I just remembered the thing that I really wanted to tell you about self-driving cars. Have you noticed that all of the cars coming out to these days have brake assist and park assist? What's that mean? It means the car has cameras all around so that it can, or generally all around now, so it can see the parking lot. And so it can see to know to brake. So if you're, you know, boogieing along, you're like, -doo 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 -doo. walk. It's not going to happen. Because at the point that you should have started applying your brakes, your car will apply it. it. It knows that there's something in front of you that's coming up closer and closer, and that you're not stopping soon enough, and it will start to apply the brakes. And it will apply them in a reasonable way so that it's not one of these mash the brakes, and lurch to a stop situations with the tires squealing and everybody turning to look and, and the crap flying off the seats. No, it'll actually break like a sane human being would, even when you're insane. And what does it mean that these cars can self-brake and self-park? Well, to self-park, it needs to have control over the steering, the gear, and, and it's got an automatic tradition, transit, transmission, and it controls the throttle. It knows it, it can throttle up and throttle down, and it can turn the steering wheel. So that's driving, right? It's backing up and it's going forward. That's driving. It's turning, and it's turning this way and it's turning that way. It's stopping and it's starting. It's driving itself into the parking spot. Brake assist means that it can see what's in front of it. Now, all that, what that means is that all that's needed to turn most of the later day cars, new cars, modern cars, into auto cars is a software upgrade. Possibly another computer module, but I'm willing to bet that the, computer, the car manufacturers have already thought of that and they've included sufficient computer resources. Because most of them, they have that, they have Wi-Fi and, and cellular bi built in too, don't they? You can, uh, you've got GPS right there on the car. You can let it handle your phone's phone calls. You can hook in directly in some cases and spread Wi-Fi around using its own cell mode. Now think about that. Your car's already got everything it needs for self-driving except for the software which is still being developed. That means that 10 years from now um, anybody can backwards compatible, anybody can reprogram their car and have a self-driving car. Now that is awesome. So uh, that's half the video. Now I'm going to go to 3D printers, and then that way I don't have to ramble so much. 3D printers, um, what's a 3D printer? Well, okay, as you know, a printer is a thing that applies ink to paper, right? Um, a 3D printer is a thing that applies material to itself, building it up, layer by layer by layer. 
much as a potter will coil a strand of potter of clay until he gets the shape of a pot before he starts to shape it. It's called additive manufacturing. Now if you're carving a marble statue or you're whittling away wood, that's subtractive manufacturing. But additive manufacturing is to take material, like a sand cat, like building a sand castle, and build it up by adding material. So when you're playing with plasticine, or you're playing with clay, or you're playing with sand, you're doing additive manufacturing in art. It's getting in my eyes. So the types of printers that are out there, one of the first ones that ever came out was one that added a, a special glue-resin combination with color to paper and then did a laser cut around that paper um, and, and a light curing. And it, it was a complicated process where each piece of paper added another layer and then the printer put liquid on there that turned it solid and then you would remove away the paper that wasn't part of the project and you'd get a full color, very realistic, very light uh, resin impregnated paper sculpture which you could then use in a variety of ways and it wasn't paper anymore because the resin had solidified it. Then they figured out filament deposition manufacturing which is the plastic 3D printers we're all getting. I have one. Um, oh, I was going to show you a, a, a thing that I made recently in my 3D printer and I went and put it away. Here's something right here. Here's a beautiful example of a 3D printed object. You see all those lines and stripes in there? Each one of those is a layer. See? It's built up in layers. So first the printer printed three little spots, then three bigger spots, and three bigger spots till it got here where it did three spots, three stripes and a, and a circle, you see? And so building it up slowly, it created this. And um, what it does is it, it's, it's like a hot glue gun on a plotter, you know, Th those, those plotters that go this way and this way, and then the, the so it, it, it moves that way and it moves that way, allowing it to get everything in one horizontal plane, and then the build plate, the, the piece of the plate under, on, on which this is glued, moves down by increments as the print head does its thing layer by layer. So it's, it's like if the print head is like a glue gun, except instead of glue, it's melting plastic. And it's laying it down on a much, much finer bead. So that's filament, that's an FDM printer. Then there's another one called an SLA printer, where they take um, a little puddle of resin with a clear, a clear bottom with a projector under it. And the resin is cured by light. So the first that the bottom layer of that resin gets exposed to that light and it gets hard. And what the printer does is it pulls the object out of the resin slowly. So it's upside down and it gradually pulls it out. And only the bottom layer of the resin gets cured by the light because the, the cured resin blocks itself. And so the, only the resin that's hit by the light, so it, it, it hits the light here, the light hits here and here. So the projector is actually sending a very fine pattern of light that changes as the object grows. And the light hardens the resin, and the resin pulls out. It's, it's faster than, than depositing plastic. And it looks really cool, and it takes up very much less space because you don't have a head moving around all over the place. You just have a square bath that the projector covers the whole thing and, and whatever the projector hits with the right amount of light, you get this. And then we've got a new one out. And this is what spurred me to want to tell you about it because this is cool. Um, it uses the same kind of resins, but instead of a bath of resin with a projector underneath, it actually spits the resin out in a very controlled series of jets. Um, and it can actually have a whole line of jets they go spit, 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 just like your bubble jet printer. And then there's a light attached to the print head. And in this case, the print head moves around to, to a degree within its space, the way that um, the, the three, my filament, my FDM printer does. But uh, if, if you have a long bar spitting out a bunch of small jets, then it could just move back and forth like a scanner, back and forth. And you can have more than one bar full of spitting jets. 
So one set of jets spits out one color of plastic, another set of jets spits out a different color of plastic, and, and so you can have different kinds of materials coming out. And they've got materials that are conductive, they've got materials that are transparent, they've got materials that are hard, materials that are soft, materials that are variations of all of that. They can even put out what's called biomaterials for medical stuff, so for instance printing an ear. Yeah, something simple right now, but once we learn how, you know that scene in Fifth Element where they take a tiny bit of DNA and they build a human out of it and they get Lilu? That's going to be possible. Whether you can animate that body, I don't know. But you could build organs that can then be put into a living body. So that's pretty exciting stuff. And um, there's a light right there on the printhead which automatically cures, hardens the resins as they land on the surface. So now you've got, you've got again, you've got the same thing with the build plate and the object sitting on it. But as each layer, it makes a pass and lays down a fresh layer only in the spots where you want it. And if you want more than one material, it lays down the correct material in those spots, pass, and as it passes, the light cures, it comes back, does it again. Back and forth, back and forth, until it builds the object. So, um, yeah, that's the latest. That is exciting. They, they don't need to be very big. I very much want to get um, an SLA printer to go with our FDM printer because it does much finer detail. Um, much prettier plastics. The resins are crazy expensive and stinky, so I don't want to use them for much, but I was thinking, for instance, of uh, making a set of earrings and then casting them with, with a, a small portable foundry um, and sand, casting sand, casting them in old aluminum pop cans. Well, there's, there's a video, there's a bunch of videos here where people show you how to build your own foundry using small container and some plaster and a blow dryer and a, and, and a blow torch and, or some coals. It's cool and I plan to build one. And uh, then you just collect up old copper pipes, you collect up um, copper wiring, you can make copper stuff, you can collect up old tin cans, well, they're not tin, they're aluminum, pop cans. You can just collect pop cans instead of taking them to the recycler, you can just put them in the foundry, create ingots and then melt those down and cast things. You could just cast directly from the cans, but I think it makes more sense to create ingots of pure aluminum first. Because your first meltdown is going to include all the paint and stuff, and you can have a scum. And there's a lot of learning to be done before I can start casting my own jewelry, but I'm thinking, when I'm living in a bus, that's going to be useful. So I'd like to have an SLA printer. There's one called the Olo that's smaller than a bread box. It's very small. I think it would make an excellent jewelry prototyper. So between the 3D printer we have, and plan to build another one like it, but bigger, um, there's, a lot, there's a lot we can do. And you can also, uh, there are people who are building printers that print pottery. Yeah, they, they put, spit out clay. They're much larger, they're designed to build much larger things, so they take up a whole room. China's got one that spits out concrete, and is built on the scale of a shipyard, and builds houses. So this technology it, of, of having something that spits out a material that hardens um, and is moved around in an XYZ scale, you know, side to side, back and forth, in and out, up and down, you know, all three directions of the three dimensions, uh, it's going to change our world. And yes, we're, you're going to lose your job. Sooner or later, you're going to lose your job. So I, I hope you're going to get creative, because that's how we're going to make money, or trade anyway. Time's up. Bye-bye. Bye from Sam. He's a good jerk. He really is.